went to my buddy Joe's wake today. Joe was a legend on the west side of town where he taught English at Elder High School for more than 40 years. When he died, the only place spacious enough to accommodate the thousands of people who came to pay their respects was the auditorium of the high school. Joe could appreciate the humor in practically anything. Seeing his open casket on display, he would have said something like, Jesus, I'm dead. I'm still at work. Displayed in the auditorium were pictures of Joe. I contributed one, a photo of the Stegner Food Products team. Cincinnati Class A Municipal League Champs. 1964. All of us proudly wearing our team jackets and two huge trophies in front of us. In the photo, I'm next to Joe, and it got me to thinking about my favorite Joe as a pitcher story, one he told every time we reminisced about our history as teammates. In municipal baseball, what we like to call semi-pro ball, games were played all over the city, which meant that guys like us who were raised behind the sauerkraut curtain might find themselves on the east side, the north side, or the south side of town, where the teams were legendary in stature, and worse, Protestant. So one Sunday afternoon at a faraway crosstown field, the Stegner Food Boys of Summer squared off against a team of giants. Now these were men, not boys, at least it seemed so to us. One of their players, rumor had it, was recently returned from the Baltimore Colts training camp, where he just missed the cut at linebacker. Clearly, we were overmatched, and Joe had been named the starting pitcher. Someone once pointed out to me that each at-bat represents a complete literary narrative with a beginning, a middle, and an end, with intensely and complexly motivated characters, the hitter and the pitcher, in direct conflict with one another, surrounded by a host of supporting characters. And all of us hoping to contribute meaningfully to the action. I played second. And even though I had a good idea how this narrative might end, the final outcome was going to be determined by these characters' interaction and by an allegedly neutral arbiter. Ball. The umpire. And sometimes by fate or God Almighty himself. And all played out within and against diamond-shaped settings of both the iconography and landscape of the game. Both as a jock and a literati. Hey. Joe would have loved this theory of baseball as the ultimate form of narrative. Now, experts on baseball will tell you that pitchers have their best or most dominating stuff about 25% of the time. When they have their best stuff, nobody can beat them. About 50% of the time, they've got good stuff, which gives them at least a chance. And then there's the 25% of the time when nothing seems to be working. This was one of those times and one of those days for Joe.
Though he labored mightily and sweated profusely, his fastball was not fast. His slider would not slide. The changeup did not change, and control was a consummation devoutly to be wished for. The top of the first inning had lasted longer than a high mass at Easter. The only dramatic question left unanswered was just how long Joe would remain in the game. With the score six zip, the bases loaded and nobody out, my father, Coach Miller, had seen enough. Oh. Now you need to know at least this much about our coaches. Both men were combat veterans of the Second World War and neither man was to be trifled with. As members of the greatest generation, they had done their duty and commanded our respect. Having saved the world, my father did not suffer fools gladly, nor did he tolerate much dissension within the ranks. Joe knew this, and he knew what was coming. In his most diplomatic tone of voice, my dad delivered the verdict. You just don't seem to have it today. So let's bring in Federley, see if we can get a couple outs. We can still win this thing. So give me the ball, son. No. Coach, I'm not coming out. Now, my dad was partially deaf, having lost most of the hearing in his right ear during an artillery barrage in the Ardennes. He honestly thought he had misheard. So a second time, he says, I'm taking you out of the game, son. No. Coach, I'm not coming out of the game. Coach, look, I can beat these guys. I know it. I'm not coming out. So look, I'll get this next batter out. Then I'll get us out of the inning. Though he'd quit school early to join the Army, my dad was a smart guy. Good judge of character who practiced a kind of follow through on your swing philosophy, which he applied to life as well as baseball. And in Joe's response, he read neither defiance nor disrespect. Instead, what he saw was determination, aggressiveness, moxie. And moxie was a value he apprised above all others. As the rest of us stood around mute and nonplussed, dad, who loved Joe like a son, simply said. I'll give you one more chance, see if you can get some outs. Let's see what you got. Let's go. Let's get him, Joe. Let's get him. Hey, skyline after the game. Yeah. I believed, and I know Joe did, that he was going to find that place in life and athletics where focus is in. Goes by many names, flow, chi, rhythm, when someone's hot or on fire. I'll just say Joe was in the zone, or seemed to be. Now, if this were a Hollywood movie, somebody like Kevin Costner or Robert Redford even Gina Davis would come through heroically in the clutch. We were all hoping for Joe's heroic moment.
This was real life. And what transpired was the hardest hit ball I'd seen in my career. The kind where you can see the stitches on the ball frozen in time. As it rises in trajectory towards the outfield, we could only stare in utter amazement as the ball cleared not only the fence, but the scoreboard. Hey, coach, I'm, uh, I'm ready to come out now. Joe Aceto, my best friend. I can't know for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if the Lord didn't get just a bit of an argument when he told Joe it was time for him to come out of the game. <laughs>